Well, good morning, and glad that you're here as well. And uh, I, too, just want to thank all the veterans for uh, giving of their time and energy uh, so that we have the freedoms that we have. And, and I know, even within our church, uh, we have individuals that have served that are really dealing with the effects of, of being at war and, and how it's affected their bodies and, and their minds, and uh, uh, we continue to lift you up in prayer. Today, we're going to continue in our series on Colossians, and as we do so, I want to, again, maybe just remind you of what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about putting on new clothes and, and how we need to, to be different in terms of, of um, really being able to become more like Jesus Christ. We talked about putting on the clothes of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, uh, this mindset that we need to bear with each other and forgive one another, and, and over all those things, we needed to put on love. And uh, we talked about how those clothes ultimately will make a difference within our Christian testimony, the witness that we are to the world that is around us, as well as just really the difference ultimately it makes within each one of our own lives. So today, uh, we are continuing to be challenged by the Apostle Paul on grabbing hold of really these wonderful attributes within our lives that can truly make the difference. Now today we're going to start with our scripture from Colossians and we're going to begin at verse 15 of chapter 3 and this is what we read in 15 through 17. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So what is Paul trying to tell the people in Colossae, and what is the Apostle Paul trying to tell us today? And, and again, as we are reminded of those clothes that we are put on, Paul takes this one step further and he says, there's a few other things that you need to make a part of your lives. And the first one is this. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. I want you to think about that for just a minute. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. What does that look like? Now, when we think of maybe the peace of Christ, and then we see that word rule, uh, there's maybe a couple different ways we can take that. But when you look at sort of the Greek meaning behind that, uh, it's actually an athletic term used to uh, de- designate the power of officials within the game. So when we look at this, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, you, you can think about athletic competitions. We have our officials, we have our ref- referees, we have our umpires, and, and what do they do? They, they control the game, uh, they control the field of play. And so when we talk about the peace of Christ ruling within our hearts, what the Apostle Paul is saying is it's going to control ultimately how we live our lives. It's, it's reminding us that the peace of Christ should control our actions, it should control how we interact with those that are around us. And God has called us ultimately to live in peace. In Romans 12, 18, we read, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So, so we're being challenged. As, as far as it depends on us, our, our goal, our challenge is to live at peace. And when we live at peace with Christ as a part of that, it determines a result. When we're intentional about peace being a part of our lives, it can make all the difference. You know, just over 100 years ago, I I learned this this past week, Argentina and Chile were at the brink of a war with each other uh, in a dispute over their boundary. I mean, they were at the point where, where they literally were going to fight with each other for where's the boundary between their two countries. And it just so happened that they recognized that it wasn't going to solve anything for them. So they decided on a different solution. And what they decided was they were going to basically just say, we are going to have peace between the two countries. This is not worth fighting over. And so what they did is they, they took their sort of cannons, they, they, they took their, their metal um, sort of weapons, and they melted them down. 
and they built a statue to represent the peace that they were going to forever have between the two countries. The statue is called Christ the Redeemer. And they have sworn that for generations to come, they would use that as a reminder for the peace that they wanted within, with, uh, amongst their two countries. And this, this statue is now found in the Andes Mountains, and it's called Christ the Redeemer of the Andes. We have a picture of it here, and I want you to see it. Um, it's, it actually, between the platform and the statue itself, uh, ultimately stands about 40 feet high. It's the tallest statue, um, uh, really, at, at the, the um, sort of altitude that it's at. It's at 12,500 feet above sea level. And on the day of the commemoration, there were a lot of people that traveled up to this mountain, and over 3,000 people attended a ceremony sort of recognizing the peace between these two countries. And it was there that both of the militaries, both of the armies also gathered with, and together they fired their guns as, as sort of like a 21-gun salute, but they fired their guns into the air to commemorate this day of peace. And since then, these two countries have had peace and they continue to use this statue as a reminder of the peace that needs to be a part of their existence. Jesus has called us to peace. In John 14, 27, we read this. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. And in Matthew 5, 9, he says this as well. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. When we make a choice to allow peace to rule within our hearts, God is going to make the change. With God's strength, we can triumph over our struggles. And with his peace, we can be calm in the chaos and have confidence despite ultimately the confusion that's around us. Again, hear those words from Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body we were called to peace and be thankful. The, the second thing that Paul tells us here is, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So again, let's look at verse 16. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Now, again, there's uh, one of those words that we need to take special note of, and that's the word dwell. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. To dwell in you means to let the word of Christ, the Holy Spirit, ultimately move in and take residence within your life. You're allowing him to move into your heart, you're allowing him to, to become a, a great presence in who you are. And we need to let the word of God reshape our priorities, reshape our thinking, and replace our old life with his new life for all of eternity. I want you to think about the power of the scriptures within each one of your lives. Are those scriptures changing who you are? Are you allowing the scriptures to make a difference in how you live? I want you for a minute to grab your Bible out of the pew. Maybe you brought your Bible with. I want you to grab, grab one. Not everyone's going to be able to grab one, but, but just grab it a minute. You can do one of two things. You can either uh, just look at the cover of it if you want. If you want, you can open it up to some pages within. But I want you to understand, ultimately, the power of, of what God's word can do within your lives. When you allow his word to dwell within you richly. Someone once said this. I want you to hear this as, as you're looking at the, the, the Bible, the scriptures that are in front of you. This book is the mind of God. It's the state of man. It's the way of salvation. It's the doom of sinners and it's the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here, 
Paradise is restored. Heaven is opened. The gates of hell exposed. Christ is the subject. Our good is its purpose. And the glory of God is its end. It should fill the memory. It should rule the heart. And it should guide the feet. Read it slowly and frequently and prayerfully. Follow its precepts and it will lead you to Calvary, to the empty tomb, to the resurrected Christ, and yes, to glory itself for all of eternity. So when it comes to the Word of God, I want to encourage you to love it. I want to encourage you to learn it, and I want to encourage you to live it. Get into the Word so that ultimately His Word can get into you. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. And Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of, of life. Now the third thing Paul tells us today in this passage is whatever you do, seek to give thanks. Whatever you do, seek to give thanks. In verse 17, he says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, our attitude ultimately can determine a lot of things. In the next couple weeks, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving. And it's an opportunity for us to reflect on the blessings uh, for which God has given to each one of us within our own lives. And if we are committed to live our lives for Jesus Christ, in whatever we do, we will see the great blessing that he has given to us. We'll be able to become very aware of his presence in so many different ways, no matter what maybe situation that we deal with. I mean, even in our struggles, even in those those things that, that we battle with, we will see blessing that comes from God. In Philippians 4.8, Paul again reminds us, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And when we are committed to give thanks, it's going to change our perspective and it's going to change our priorities. You will start to count your blessings and not your burdens. You will be grateful for what you have and less greedy ultimately for what you don't have. And you will be filled with hope and not helplessness. And you will look for what's right and not look for what is always wrong. So change your attitude and heart to one ultimately of that of giving thanks. So, Now between really this clothe yourself with the compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bear with one another, forgive one another, put on love. And then Paul now has also said, you know, let the peace of Christ, you know, um, rule in your life and let the word of God dwell within your heart and that we are to give thanks. Paul says now Grab hold of those things within in your life, making them a part of who you are, because now here's the application. And the application he goes on now in this next part of the passage is in the relationships that are around you. And he begins with, first of all, the family. And he says, when basically Paul's trying to tell us, when you get it right with the family, you're going to get it right with, with all the other people you interact around you. And so we read this beginning in in, uh, verse 18 of chapter 3. It says, Wives, submit submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. So Paul starts with the family and then he goes on in verse 22 and he says, now look at the other relationships that are around you. And obviously today we're not dealing with slaves and masters, but we're dealing with employers and employees. We're dealing with with friendships and relationships that are around us. And he says, slave, obey your earthly masters in everything you do and do it, not only whether their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. 
Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ who you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. So Paul's now t- telling us, if we are committed, and he was telling the church in Colossae, if you're committed to clothe yourselves and, and put these things on, and now you take them and you move them into the relationships that are around you, you literally are going to be able to change the world. And, and he begins talking about the home. You know, the f- fund- fundamental building block of civilizations is the family. And marriage ultimately is the glue that holds those things together. The health of our culture, its citizens, and their children is intimately linked to the health and the well-being of families and the well-being of marriage. So if I were to ask you this morning, what's the difference between a house and a home, what would you tell me? I think, for me, the difference is that a house is just where people stay, and they live, and they just exist. They, they come and go. They, they have their meal and they're, they're out the door. There's, there's really no interaction with them somehow in some way. And, and unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of that in our world today. But a home is different. A home is where people live and where they're taking care of each other. And they're loving each other. And they're always ready to help each other. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote these words, knew that Christ not only changes lives, but when it changes our life, it changes our families, and then it changes our homes. And Paul writes to believers, and he appeals to them, ultimately, to live for Jesus Christ. Now, over the past several weeks, we've been looking at this book of Colossians, we've been talking about how Christ is is, uh, supreme and Christ is sufficient, We've been talking about how, how he's in control of everything, and, and we've been talking about he is all we need. But we've also been talking about really this change that we need to make within our lives in terms of how we live for Jesus Christ. And Paul tells us that a renewed a life, a, a changed life, is going to affect the ordinary relationships within a household. It's going to affect the relationship between a wife and her husband. It's going to affect the relationship between children and their parents. And it's going to affect a relationship between a servant and a master, or in our case, they said an employer or employee. And the tie between ultimately all these groups is bridged together by a new understanding of the mutual need of each other and the respect that we have for one another. If we break it down, I first want to begin, first of all, with verse 19, where it says, Husband, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. The key word here is love. Husbands, love. Paul pushes that as husbands, we need to express tender and wholehearted and sacrificial concern toward our wives. You know, the measure of a man's love for his wife is not seen in the gifts or the words. I I think a lot of people can do that. You know, I love you. Uh, Here's this wonderful gift I want to give you. Uh, The real measure of a man's love in their relationship with their wife is going to be in the acts of sacrifice and concern for her happiness and her well-being. And we are called ultimately, to love our wives with tender and faithful affection. And we need to exercise compassionate care. And in doing so, our wife responds with a submission to his loving leadership. You know, men as, as husbands, you have a huge responsibility. And I know we've talked about this before, but I don't think it hurts to continue to be reminded as, as a husband, as the head of the household, you have a huge responsibility. The thing of it is, is you are looked up to. And you are setting an example to follow. Whether it's, it's with your wife seeing who you are and, and how you live out your life or your children. You are setting an example that's going to impact your family for generations to come. 
And all you need to do is you need to look around and you see many husbands that are not putting Christ first within their lives. And you ultimately see the negative effects that start to play out within the family. Grabbing hold of God's love within your life and putting on the spiritual clothes that Paul has instructed us with and then loving your wife and your children in a way that God has called you to love them is going to make all the difference. I mean, think about how you talk to your wife. What words ultimately are you using? Are you creating bitterness and anger, maybe grief and irritation? Or are you creating an environment of love, care, and encouragement? Remember. Remember what we're supposed to close ourselves with. What is happening in your household? You know, there was a, a man who, uh, and his ever-nagging wife, who went on vacation to Jerusalem. I mean, she was always nagging him about this, and always nagging him about that. They decided to go on this vac- vacation to Jerusalem, and as they're there, she happens to die. So she's dead. She, they go to the sort of um, uh, undertaker, and the undertaker says to the husband, well, for $5,000, we can ship her back to the United States with you, or for $150, we can do the funeral uh, right here and bury her here right here in Jerusalem in the Holy Land. And... Um, uh, he says, what do you want to do? And the man says, well, I need to think about it. And eventually the man comes back and he says, I've decided I want to send her, send her back to the United States. And, and of course, this undertaker says, why would you want to spend $5,000 to send her back to the United States when you could spend only $150 and she would be buried here in the Holy Land in Jerusalem? And the man replies, well, you know, long ago there was a man that died here and he rose again from the grave three days after that. He says, I I just can't take that chance. (laughs) You know, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when a relationship between a husband and a wife isn't what it should be. God has designed marriage to be a wonderful thing. And it begins with us as husbands and how we love our wives. When we close ourselves with that compassion and that kindness and that gentleness and those those attributes that Paul is saying we need to put on, it will make all the difference. Now we're going to jump back a verse to verse 18 because there there's this instruction to wives. It says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting shin. In other words, it's forced upon him where it's like, oh, look at what the scriptures have to say here. It says, you need to submit to me so you better do it. You know, with that mentality. And, and that's not the intention. The intention is so much different than that. We, we, we are demanding our wives' respect when in reality, if we're living the way that God has called us to as husbands, that respect will come because we are, are living out the characteristics of who Jesus Christ is within our lives. And when we're not, and we're demanding that respect, and, and we're saying that you need to submit to me, at some point we're being very hypocritical because we're not looking at what God has called us to do. And as a wife, your role is to follow your husband's leadership as as long as it doesn't compromise her loyalty in her relationship with Jesus Christ. Her loyalty first is to Jesus Christ. And when you think about God, there was equality in creation, but there was a difference in function between a man and a woman. And if a husband is loving her as God has called him to, there's no wife that would likely be objecting to submitting to her husband. You know, I think about my own relationship with with Chris. And I, I, I would ask myself the question, does Chris submit to me? Sure she does. But I have never forced that upon her. I am sure she submits because I have worked hard to love her as, as I love Jesus Christ. And I want to take what Jesus has done within my life, and I want to carry that over into her life so she can experience the fullness of that love. 
And she submits because of how she's been loved. Think about your own relationship with Jesus Christ. Does Jesus force us? Does he tell us we need to submit to him? I don't think so. But why do we do it? We submit to our Heavenly Father because we recognize and know the incredible love that He had for us. He was willing to give up His one and only Son for us. And because of that, I I recognize and I grab hold of that love. We ultimately all should be able to grab hold of that. And because of that, then what do we want to do? We want to submit to our Heavenly Father because we know He's shown us ultimately what true love is about. Wives, you need to do do so within your relationship with your husband. And when when you're committed and willing to do that, there's great beauty in a marriage relationship. That is the result of living our lives in, in Christ, and there's a blessing that God gives. Now we go on to verse 20, because now it comes to the children. It says in verse 20, children... Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And I'm sure there's parents out there right now going, yes! I hope they heard that. And I want you to hear that a little bit today too. You know, the problem we face with sin as a part of our lives, especially as kids, is it's hard for us to obey our parents because the sin within our lives is saying, don't do that. You know, don't obey your parents. Don't follow the instructions and from God and the commands that he's given to us. But God is calling you as children to obey your parents as long, again, as your parents are walking in God's will and walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. I want you to note how it just seems to keep trickling down. If a husband is right with God and he's loving his wife the way that she should, Now, as a husband and wife, they're in that relationship with God and they're loving the children the the way that they should. It's going to make all the difference in the world. And sometimes, children, I think you think, oh, we're so, you know, uh, we we live in a world where we're, we're being so held back by our parents. But in the ancient world, I want you to hear this. Because then you'd be like, I can be a little bit more thankful for my parents right now. In the ancient world, children were under the domination of their parents, especially the father. And, and if, if the parents so choose, they could actually sell their kids into slavery. It's like, you know what, they're misbehaving, forget it. I don't need them a part of my life. I'm just going to make a little bit of money and I'm going to send them off to become slaves. Or they could look at them as a hired hand and they could just put them out in the fields to work. And in extreme, extreme um, situations, a parent could even condemn their child to death and the parent could actually even carry out the, it's their, their own execution. And we think, well, how could they do that? But it's a great example of the fact that without God, this kind of evil ultimately prevails. And it's a reminder to us of how important God needs to be within the family relationship. Children, you need to know it pleases God when you obey them. And it makes life so much easier. I mean, that's the little hint I want to tell you. It it does. It it, it makes life so much easier. There were two little boys who were on their way to to school one day, and they were talking about their families, and and the one little boy said, I figured out a system for getting along with my mother. And the other one's like, oh yeah, what is it? And he says, it's very simple. She tells me what to do, and I do it. Children, Many of the battles that you have with your parents are not worth the consequences, the hurt, and the pain that is being created. And awful those battles bring separation and a loss of what ultimately love should look like in a family relationship. And the thing of it is, as kids, when you obey your parents, it pleases God. I mean, when you think of the commandments, And and he says, honor your father and mother. mother." There's a promise that comes with it. It's one of the few times that God brings a promise across. And so children, when you obey your uh, parents, there's blessing that will come from it. It's a better way to please God when you're obeying your parents. And it develops strong characteristics that will allow you someday 
to be a great parent to your own children. And then Paul goes on, on in verse 21, and he comes back to the fathers again for just a little bit. And he reminds the fathers of their responsibility, and he says, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. You know, the last thing that I think any of us as parents want to do is quench our children's zeal for life. Fathers, mothers, it can be both. And as parents, we can very easily do that. There are three things that father can, fathers can do to discourage their children. If you want to discourage your children as fathers, maybe as fathers and mothers, here's the three things you should do. Now, obviously, I'm not telling you to do that. But, but think about it. Maybe this is ha- happening within your home. The first one is, is you can ignore them. Your child needs your attention. And if you don't give it to them, then ultimately they're going to come to resent you. And for a lot of them, they're going to find that attention somewhere else. And in doing so, their needs are not going to be met. You know, I often see that in in relationships. Uh, You know, you see it with fathers and children. When when their fathers ignore them, and I especially see it within girls, um, they will look for relationships outside of the home. You know, and there's often, you know, this pattern of, of young ladies who are always in need of a boyfriend because they're not being loved by their father at home. If we ignore our kids, they're going to grow to resent us. The second thing that we can do to, to really discourage our children is to indulge them. This type of father gives their child everything that they want. In other words, we, we spoil them. And because of that, our kids become restless and dissatisfied. Uh, There's never a contentment there that needs to be there. And the third thing that we can do is insult them. Criticize them and even call them names. And you will destroy them really quick. If you use sarcasm and you, you ridicule them, you can knock really the stuffing out of a child faster than anything else. So think about how, as parents, you're interacting with your kids. Are some of these things happening? And if they are, I encourage you to just please stop and say, it's time to to put on those clothes. It's time to grab hold of the love and make your household so much different. Parents, I would encourage you to not do those things to your children. Compliment them as much as you can. Of course, there are going to be times when you need to discipline them. Spend time together. Maybe eat supper every once in a while together. You know, there was a survey a a few years ago by MTV and Associated Press asking kids um, what brings them the most happiness. And their number one response was spending time with their families. It's very easy for us to get busy with this and that, and and sometimes we think this is what's going to make them better, and yet the reality of it is, is the best thing we can do for our kids is just simply to spend time with them. And you need to know it doesn't cost you anything. I think if you would ask any parent who now has their children grown up and out of the house if there's something maybe they could do different, there, there would be probably a response from, from many of them saying, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. You know, as we finish this morning, I'm reminded that the impact of our relationships with each other directly results from our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I, didn't, I could have addressed, you know, the one other, and that's our relationship with, with the people we work with and, and how we work and, and that passage of, you know, do, don't do it as, as you're doing it for man, but do it unto the Lord, you know. But that, it, it trickles down, and, and, and it'll just continue to, to be a wonderful thing in all the relationships that you have. But it begins with Jesus, and it begins with us being willing to make a change, to say, I'm going to grab hold of these things within my life. You know, there was a story of a man who wanted to change the world. And he found out it was ultimately difficult to change the world. So he decided maybe he could just change his nation. And when he found he couldn't change his nation, he thought, well, you know what, maybe I can change my town. 
And when that didn't work, he thought, well, you know, maybe I just need to try to change my family. And he discovered that didn't work. And as an old man, he realized the only thing that he could ultimately change was himself. By, by knowing God and living out God's love. And, and when he realized that, what he recognized is that change started to come in a lot of other ways. It started to impact his family. And because it impacted his family, it impacted his community. And because it impacted his community, it impacted the nation. And because it impacted the nation, it impacted the world. And it was then that the world was changed. So it begins with us. It begins with what we are committed and willing to do. As husbands, as wives, as children, and our other relations, we need to be committed to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience, forgiveness and love. And as we read in the passage today, verses 3, chapter 3, 15 through 17, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's the application for this week. That's what I want you to take home, those three verses, and allow them to make a difference within your lives. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word on this day. Lord, Paul was speaking boldly to the people in Colossae, but he's speaking boldly to us. It's easy for us to forget what a difference you can make within our lives. And when we allow ourselves to be changed, it can make an incredible impact on our, on our wife, on our children, on, on our families. It can make an impact on our relationships beyond that and the world that is around us. I pray today that you will stir our hearts to think about how are we living our lives? Are we, are we grabbing hold of those characteristics and attributes within our own lives? And are they being lived out in the relationships that are around us? Thank you for your, the power of your word and may your Holy Spirit move us to action. And we ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. As we finish today, I want you to hear these words from Colossians one more time as our benediction. And this again, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen.